Hello and welcome back to another episode of FPV Reviews. As most of you know, my name is Spike and we've been doing several custom builds lately for people. A couple the going to the United States and then this one is that, that we're building for some friends that we have in Norway. And this one we really wanted to show you today because of some of the unique modifications at their request. Some of the other applications of the aircraft have been, at least to me, very interesting. Everything from agriculture mapping to monitoring of livestock and cattle. Uh, this particular aircraft will have kind of a more diverse application, uh, including land surveys, and it's going to even have sirens on it for herding of cattle. So this is very interesting, but let's give a brief overview of some of the modifications that at their request that we made to the aircraft. Back here in the tail, one of the first things you notice looking at this aircraft, there's dual split control surfaces for the rudder and elevator with dual servos. Here at the rear end of the fuselage, there's the split type air brakes that open out to the sides. The landing gear is heavy duty and is, is beefed up from the stock landing gear. It's using four inch wheels, so this is ideal for landing on rough or unprepared terrain. The, the motor nacelles are, have been doubled up into a box structure. This is a modification that's very commonly done in the kit version of the aircraft, but can also be done with a scratch build. This aircraft was actually built from the laser cut kit available from Squ Flying Squirrel Models at gmail.com. So, you know, you can either send me an email or send them an email to inquire about uh, the purchasing of the laser cut kit. Uh, also, the, the nose wheel is uh, heavy duty as well. It's, uh, it's a dual strut type. And we actually, due to the, the longer, um, larger structure that supports it, we had to make a, a nose fairing that's extended to, to cover that. Also, the, the dihedral in the wings is the stock dihedral, according to the original plans. But there also is an option now for about two-thirds less dihedral, so roughly one-third of the original dihedral. And that's found by some people to be best for flying the aircraft with an autopilot and in gusty, turbulent conditions near the ground, for instance, for agriculture mapping. So that's an option, and that, that option, those, those parts, those optional parts and drawings come with, as an option with the kit, or come with the standard plans when you purchase them now. If you've already purchased the plans, just send me an email. I'll be happy to send you the, the documents uh, for the, the update for, for that modification as well, if you want less dihedral than the, than the original. So the motors on this are the stock motors, and the propellers are the stock propellers. They're 13 by 8, and the motors are E-Flight Power 15, 950 kV motors. So they're completely stock. They're also using the stock 50 amp ESCs that we recommend. So also let's get, um, get into it a little bit deeper and take a more detailed look at, you know, closer up at some of these modifications. First, the nose gear. We used a dual strut type with adjustable height and eight point mounting. A 4-inch nose wheel fits easily inside this robust strut assembly. We created a direct arm-to-arm -arm drive using a high-torque servo. We used 3 16 axles to mount the set of 4-inch wheels to the aluminum main gear borrowed from a Great Plains giant big stick. The ESCs are mounted in the modified box-style motor nacelles close to the motors and easily serviceable. They are held in place by these access panels. 
tunnel-style cooling is more than adequate, and we've left the rear of the nacelles open to let the air pass through. Plenty of dihedral in the outer wing sections gives good ground clearance for obstacles on takeoff and landing. Long-range UHF antennas in both wingtips are ideal for later installation of dual operator control systems and are removable for servicing. All control services use these robust hinges meant for much larger aircraft. High quality metal gear servos and secure control links make for safe operation. Balsa block type wing tips prevent damage to the wing during transport and in the event of a wing tip strike. Underneath the aircraft, dual swappable payload bays allow quick and easy changes of the sensors and equipment. The split air brakes help manage the approach and make for shorter landings. Multiple positions are possible with these air brakes. Dual split rudders and dual rudder servos ensure that if a servo fails, control will not be lost. The elevator is also redundant and utilizes the same control principles as the rudder. As you can see here, there is plenty of room for access to both sides of the electronics bay, located underneath the wing. The rear swappable payload bay is very large, and it's shown here with a standard stapler inside for size comparison. Okay, so we're out here at the flying field now, at the local model flying field, and we've got the airplane in the configuration we usually use for transporting it. Now it fits in the trunk of our car this way, but it may not for some people. So the nose cone, the nose fairing can be removed with four screws in this case, and the center wing section can also be removed from the aircraft, but we don't find that necessary for us. We also leave the wing joiner plates attached to the center wing section and we leave this screw back here that holds the tail assembly on in place just so that we don't lose it. Also in the rear cargo area that we like to call the trunk we keep some of the hardware for the airplane. In this case we keep it in a plastic bag so it doesn't get lost inside the airframe. Uh, some of the tools and screws and things that we use to assemble the aircraft in the field. And I also keep the propellers in here just so they don't get lost. So now we'll, uh, we'll start assembling the aircraft. We got our props here. These are 13 by eight. And one of them is a P style propeller. These are thin electric props. And that's P for pusher. So they, they rotate different directions. Now some people have used props on the Gemini version 2 which turn the same direction and they've reported that it flies fine. But just uh, just for the sake of being balanced we like to use counter rotating props. So the, the correct direction for them to, to turn or uh, for the motors to turn is inward toward the top. So if you look at the top of the motor it would be rotating to the inboard part like this and the same on this motor. So they rotate in this way toward each other at the top. So the P propeller or the pusher propeller will go on the right side of the aircraft, my left. So we put that on. Spin the propeller nut on and Instead of carrying a large wrench for this, I just use this small screwdriver. I put it right through the hub. There's a hole drilled in it from the factory. And I'll grab the propeller like this on both sides, as well as the screwdriver on both sides, and make sure that's nice and snug. And we'll do the same for the other propeller.
Again, grabbing both instruments from both sides. Make sure nothing gets overstressed or bent. Make it nice and snug, and we'll just double check visually that the propellers go forward when they're turned top inward. So that's the correct direction. So that's ready. This is the carbon tube that joins the center wing section to the outer sections. We're going to very carefully insert this because we don't want to damage the ribs inside the center wing section. So we'll, we'll put it in here very carefully and as it starts to build pressure, it's not a lot of pressure, we'll, um, we'll kind of twist it back and forth like this as we put it in. And that just uh, helps it keep centered as it goes in and make sure it doesn't damage anything. So we'll, we'll put that about in the middle and the outer wing sections will push it into its final place. Here's one of the outer wing sections. These have another carbon tube inside of them, just a short section of it, which telescopes around the outside of the center wing spar. So that, that just helps you when you plug the wings together. So we want to very carefully grab this and kind of wiggle it around and it will slide on that wing tube. Now it's okay at that point to with a little distance here to go ahead and just let the wing rest there, its own weight, it's fine. It's very strong. And we'll plug in the servo wire for the left aileron. Make sure that snaps into place. And then we'll we'll make sure all the wires go in their holes as we put it in. And it slides smoothly over the wing joiner plate and lines up on the carbon fiber alignment dowels. Then we'll grab the wing and push it in, and there it's in place. So to hold it in place, next we'll put in the screws that hold the wing joiner on the bottom of the wing. So now we'll insert the screws into the outer wing sections through the joiner plate. And this will hold the wing on in flight so it doesn't slide off. This joiner plate actually has four screws, so it's uh, redundant in that way. If one of the screws were to fall out in flight or be stripped or for some reason get forgotten, the wing still wouldn't come off the airplane. So we'll do that and we'll repeat that for the right wing. So now that the wings are on the airplane, the tail is next. Now we've left the horizontal screwed to the vertical uh, for our transport. It can be removed as well if you need to make it more compact. Uh, but in this case, we, we were able to fit it in the car, so we just left them together from the last time that we put it together. So you'll notice the vertical tail here has a tongue, a wooden tongue here, and that fits in a slot inside the aircraft. So what we're going to do, we're going to place this in the slot. We're going to feed the wires in and then we're going to hold the, the tongue down as we slide the vertical stab into the fuselage. And we can actually look down here and see that it slides and goes into the slot. So that's, Im that's important. And it won't get in all the way if it is not in its slot. So we'll just uh, put it down there like that, make sure it's press down slightly. We'll go in and there it's in the slot and then we just push it all the way forward and it should all look good and line up here. And after that we'll take uh, this bolt, this tail bolt, we'll insert it here. And it gets a nylock locking nut. So we'll use a wrench and a screwdriver to tighten that up. Now you can actually tighten this fairly tight because there's a wooden block inside the a box structure inside the vertical stabilizer. But there's really no need to tighten it very tight. So we'll just put it a bit snug there so that there's some pressure on both sides and that'll hold it on very firmly during flight. 
so here's the wires inside the fuselage. These, these ones here in my left hand are coming from the tail, and the ones in my right hand go through the fuselage up to the receiver. So we're going to connect them. They're labeled rudder and elevator. Now normally there would only be two servo connections here to make. And on this aircraft there's four connections to make because of the dual servos in the tail. So we'll go ahead and plug those in. Rudder. This is also for the rudder. And for the elevator. Okay, so those are plugged in and we're going to secure them in place with some snaps. These plastic snaps that are made specially for this. And these are real nice because you you just put the servo wire in there and just press and it snaps right in. And that keeps them from pulling out in flight. So there we go. Now we'll take those and stuff them back in the aft compartment so they're out of the way in the aft payload bay. Keeps that nice and open and clean. And we'll go ahead and fasten the rear hatch in place. Before we fly the airplane, we just want to make sure the controls are all working. Make sure the elevator, the rudder, nose wheel, and ailerons all move in the correct direction. Now, the, for Gemini version 2, the control throws are not really critical. You just want to make sure you have plenty of throw. It's not a, an aircraft that will snap roll or do any of these aerobatic maneuvers, so it's really not critical that that the controls be set to a certain throw you know it'll it'll fly pretty much no matter what you do as long as you have enough control authority we like a little bit of expo on the elevator and on the ailerons but we don't use any on the rudder and for those we use about 30 percent also um, we like um, to set up some mixing from the ailerons as the master to the rudder as a slave so that when you actuate the ailerons you get about 70 to 80 percent of rudder throw as well and if you build the Gemini as as per the plans the the version 2 you can simply use a Y harness to connect the nose gear servo with the rudder servo and they'll both move in the same direction. For this airplane we had to do a little bit of special mixing because the nose wheel servo being modif modified moves in the opposite direction happened to from the rudder servos. So we've set up an extra channel and we've we've slaved that channel to the rudder and we reversed it so that it moves the opposite way. And we also set up a mix with the ailerons on this particular aircraft so that when you move the ailerons it also moves the nose wheel. So you can basically steer the airplane on the ground with the right or the left stick. So now that we've uh, checked the controls, let's uh, do a power run up and just make sure that both motors are running strong, the thrust is in the correct direction, and that, that um, that we have plenty of battery power uh, to complete a safe takeoff. So we're going to do a run up here. We're going to go all the way to full power. Okay, so that's good. We'll chop the throttle. And we want to make sure both the propellers wind down 
and stop about at the same time. That tells us that the motors were running at about the same speed and they have about the same turning resistance, which tells me they're about health they're healthy. So if one were to slow down and stop way before the other one, you know, we'd know we have a problem with one of the motors. So that's kind of a a check that you can do right before the 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 takeoff. We'll check, make sure that the air brakes are working. So that's checked, the air brakes are retracted. One last thing that we want to check before we send the aircraft up in the air is the center of gravity. Now these, uh, the plates, the wing joiner plates, have those holes drilled in the bottom of them. So we'll put our fingers down under there and feel for those holes. They shouldn't be too hard to find. Okay, so these are the holes right here. This is the forward and the aft position for the recommended center of gravity and we'll, we'll lift the aircraft up and at the rear hole we notice that it's slightly nose heavy and at the forward hole it's slightly tail heavy so as long as the center of gravity is somewhere in between those it's fine it'll be very hard to tell the difference in the air so we're ready to go flying Well, we want to thank everybody for watching and don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe to this channel so you don't miss anything we do in the future. Also, if you're really interested in what we're doing here, you might want to subscribe to our Barrowspace Insider channel. We'll put a link to that in the description. Also, don't forget to visit our website. A lot of the questions that people have are already answered there on the website. 
a lot of the specs and more information about the airframe and the Tesla style battery that we're using to power the aircraft are there on the website as well. That's barrowspaceindustries.com. So we'll put a link as well in the description to that. And we just want to thank you all for watching and have a good day.